I'm going to talk about how we can make these flexible and squishy lenses from silicone with a 3D printer and a very basic CNC mill at home. This only works for concave molds, which make convex convex or planar convex lenses. And I admit that whole thing is certainly something of a niche topic. But I mean, that's what the internet is for, niche topics. Making a lens or a lens mold on a CNC mill might not always be the best idea, but sometimes it may make sense. Especially if you're working with acrylic or aluminum as a material and your expectations are somewhat limited. Good enough is often all you need, and I guess I'm going to say that a lot in the next few minutes. But, quick disclaimer, I'm neither a mechanist, nor do I have a clue about optics. I'm just someone with a problem and trying to solve it somehow. I'll explain what did work well for me if you know more about that stuff. Your feedback is much appreciated. So, back to the problem. For a project, I wanted to make some lenses from soft silicone. For that, I need the inverted shape of the lens as a mold, so I can pour the liquid silicone into it. And once it hardens, I get a soft lens. The problem with any optical surface that should work as a lens is that you need both a perfect overall shape and a perfect surface quality. If your shape is distorted, your focal length may be off, or you get some horrible imaging artifacts. If your surface is rough or has tiny scratches, you will get fogging or lose contrast. You can buy high-quality lenses for a bit of money, covering most diameter and focal length from Thor Labs or Admit Optics. You just buy the negative version of what you actually need and put it into your mold. That's pretty nice because you get your perfect shape and optically a surface as a part of the lens for an okayish amount of money. The problem? It's borosilicate glass. And that's about three quarters silicon dioxide. Silicone with an E basically just sticks to silicone and silicon, so itself and glass. Instead of glass lenses, you could purchase plastic lenses as well and they will be considerably less expensive. But I couldn't really find a supplier with a decent catalog that actually sells to customers directly and not just business to business. I did a few tests with mold release to coat a glass surface for silicone molding and see if I could make it work anyway, but the mold release agent, either sprayed wax or liquid wax, just messes up the optical surface. The molding and separation work fine, but the surface gets a texture, so it's not acting as a lens anymore. So I can't buy the surface I need, I guess I need to make it myself. With a proper CNC or a lathe, you can cut the geometry you want and just go directly to polishing to reduce the surface roughness. The important part is only that the polishing tool follows the existing surface as closely as possible and polishing out the tiny hills and valleys in the surface. But when the geometry is not perfect yet, you need something you can use as a tool and it needs to have exactly the curvature you want in the end, just inverted or mirrored. The most precise spherical surface I could find for a reasonable price was precision ball bearings. That's hardened steel or ceramic and you'll find quite a decent collection of different sizes. You can buy even the larger ones in small quantities pretty easily. Basically, it's perfect. Almost done with the introduction. But before I start, there are a few YouTube videos which I can highly recommend. There are lens carving videos by Brown CNC, there is a video about acrylic polishing by Applied Science, a video about lens molding by Breaking Taps, one by Adam the Mechanist about metal polishing, and one by Hörchens Optics about glass lens polishing. All of them contain a ton of helpful information, but none of them did solve my problem completely, so that's the reason why you are able to watch this video right now. First off, mold materials. I've made some molds from acrylic and from aluminum. Acrylic has a perfect optical surface on all areas that you're not machining and is a lot easier to work with. Aluminum is slightly more complicated to machine, but it's a bit easier to polish because it's harder, but more on that later. When buying acrylic, there are two varieties, GS and XT. GS is created by pouring liquid acrylic between two extremely flat glass plates. XT is extruded through a die and then pressed between rollers. Jess is slightly more expensive and is only sold as plates and blocks, 
while XD is available in a variety of shapes. But GS has lower amounts of internal stress in the material, so for milling that's a reasonable choice. When you want to work with aluminum, buy an alloy that's hard enough for milling. I've used an alloy without silicon, but I would guess that trace amounts in the alloy might not really be a problem for silicone molding. Next step, end mills. When milling, no matter the toolpath strategy, we will create some kind of steps in the material. The simple way to reduce that is to use a ball end mill. The larger the radius, the smoother the transition between the steps. And every bit of smoothness we can achieve during milling saves us a lot of polishing effort later on. I did test two carbide end mills, a two flute 6mm end mill, a two flute 8mm end mill, and a single flute 6mm end mill with a polycrystalline diamond tip. All of these end mills were brand new, so the flutes should have been nice and sharp. For comparison, I'm looking at the acrylic surfaces right of the CNC. And surprisingly, the 6mm standard end mill looks best. Maybe that's an issue with my speeds and feeds, so takes us with a grain of salt. Anyway, let's talk about toolpaths before moving on. I'm using Fusion 360 here for CAD and CAM, and Fusion is basically giving us three different options. A parallel toolpath, where the tool is just going back and forth in lines, varying the depth of cut. A scalloping toolpath going in circles, lifting the tool after each circle. And finally, the spiral toolpath, lifting the tool continuously while spiraling. But when looking at a few test pieces, I couldn't see much of a difference, so I'm sticking to spiral. An additional note, I'm using a DIY CNC mill here. That's certainly not a perfect machine. It has a certain amount of angular error in all axes. There's a tiny bit of miscalibration in the steps per millimeter. And it has some backlash. Basically, it's what you would expect from a CNC machine at home. This does, in a way, affect what makes sense and what doesn't. The error by the machine may be considerably larger than the difference between end mills or toolpath strategies. But the result is pretty clear. Both the general shape and the surface quality directly of the CNC are not perfect. For example, I'm not quite sure who's to blame for this circular pattern. Maybe it's Fusion 360's toolpath settings, maybe it's Fusion's G-code generator, or maybe it's my CNC controller. But I still need to remove a bit of material to even out the spherical surface and get rid of the scratches afterwards. That brings us to the next step, grinding and polishing. To actually grind and polish the material, some abrasives are needed. Usually people will use silicon carbide and cerium oxide for glass, maybe something cheaper like aluminum oxide for acrylic. That's what's used in these polishing creams. But it's pretty hard to get small quantities of these abrasive powders. Shopping around on AliExpress or Amazon you can find lapping pastes with diamond particles. These are pretty expensive per gram compared to powders and probably overkill, but I won't need much, so that's what I used. Now we just need to press the bearing ball against the mold and move it for a few hours. Of course, I have very little interest in doing that manually, so let's modify a machine for that. You can use whatever you got. There is very little force involved, so a cheap 3D printer with a few additional printed parts totally does the job. I'm using the CNC because it was the easiest option. I just remove the spindle and screw a fourth stepper motor to the bed which can spin a piece of plastic with the ball. Instead of the spindle, I put a holder on the Z column that can slide up and down. The holder presses a mold on the ball bearing and has a ball joint so the mold can tilt. I'm using a clamp to prevent the mold from spinning at a small weight on top of the holder, but be careful, too much pressure prevents the parts from grinding properly. If it's working as expected, you can actually hear the grinding. I wrote a small script to generate G-codes that moves the X and Y axes in a circular pattern to change the center of rotation. Otherwise it would look something like this. The ball bearing spins and would move the lapping paste at a high speed across the circumference, while the center would not move at all. When I move the ball bearing while spinning, I can reduce the difference a bit. Of course this whole setup will still not result in a perfectly even polishing action across the whole surface, but I guess it's good enough.
Once in a while, I'm removing the mold, cleaning it, and putting it in front of a camera and under a microscope. Especially the first and largest size, 40 microns, takes forever, because the shape of the cavity is not perfectly spherical, and the ball bearing needs to grind it down a lot before it makes contact evenly. But once that's done, about an hour or so per grain size is more than enough. Let's give it a look under the microscope. That's a bit tricky because microscope objectives have a very shallow focal plane, and the surface we want to inspect has a pretty decent curvature. One solution to that is simply to put the lens on a motorized macro slider and do some focus stacking. I'll explain my workflow for that in the blog post linked in the description. By the way, we will be looking top down on this section of the part. In the microscope image, we see that the rough surface, which reflects the light, becomes finer and finer after each polishing step. At 7 microns, the acrylic is beginning to clear up both on camera and under the microscope. When all the scratches from the previous grain size are gone, we can move on to the next one. When we go smaller, getting rid of all the particles is not so easy. I lost a lot of time and I had to go back several grain sizes because I got big fat scratches on my nice surface. In the end I just 3D printed the part which holds the ball bearing several times and just use a fresh one when switching to smaller particles. Adding magnets to prevent the ball from moving helps to keep the contamination to a minimum as well. Sometimes the lapping paste needs a bit of thinning so the oil film with the diamond particles is as thin as possible. I used WD-40 for that, but probably any other mineral oil would work as well. Eventually, at 2.5 microns, I stopped. The surface is still not perfect, and you can see the fogging and a bit of larger scratches if you look closely. Probably there is a limit to what you can achieve here anyway. Usually when polishing or lapping, the tool should be softer than the object you want to polish. For example, when polishing lenses, people use pitch, which is technically not even a solid material. It slowly deforms and exactly mimics the shape of the surface. In our case, it's the opposite. Both aluminum and acrylic are softer than hardened steel, and that may be an issue at a small scale. Another problem is that I'm very sure that the uneven material removal rate will have made the surface slightly wider around the rim. But I have neither tools nor knowledge to measure the deviation from the sphere perfectly. But it's obviously light years ahead of my hand polishing attempts. Anyway, I'm going to use this lens molded off this thing as a spherical singlet. So the imaging errors area of center would already be clearly visible even when the lens would be perfectly manufactured. Let's move on to the last step. Make it squishy. I'm not going to talk too much about pouring silicone, there are people who explain that way better than I could. Just the basics. We mix both components of the silicone and put that in a cheap vacuum chamber to remove the air bubbles. Sadly, that step is not optional. Once it's degassed, we pour it and wait a few hours before removing it from the mold. That's all. But we actually need a silicone that's optically clear and reasonably soft. And that's more of an issue. A lot of research papers that did something with soft optical sensors use a platinum cure silicone called XP565 by the company Silicones Inc. But that was impossible to purchase for me in Europe. Some other researchers use Smooth On Solaris. That's a potting silicone made for sealing solar cells and electronics, so it's reasonably clear. Sadly, that stuff was just absurdly expensive. The problem in general is that many silicones you find online are in some way described as translucent or transparent or clear or even optically clear, but only in the last case you can be sure about what you get. But even then, I tested one that looked pretty good on first glance, Seal Glass 25, but it is marketed as a special effect silicone because it's extremely brittle and breaks like ice. Sadly, that's not what I need. After a few more candidates, I settled on Troll Factory's Type 19. Clarity is sufficient, price is okay-ish, and it's mechanically robust. The only problem? It's very viscous and a bit fast-acting. You got about 5 minutes for mixing, degassing, and purring once you added the catalyst to the base component. Anyway, if you're in Europe, that may be your best choice.
But the problem of highly viscous silicone is getting rid of the trapped air. That's true for both the bubbles created by mixing the components and the air trapped in the mold when pouring. I decided that I don't want to use any thinner for the silicone and just fill the mold in the vacuum I need for degassing anyway. For that I built a simple contraption of a cup clipped to a servo motor that perfectly fits inside my vacuum chamber. It's a Raspberry Pi running on a power bank, so I don't need to put any holes in the vacuum chamber for cables. Bonus, there's a camera to actually watch the purring progress in the acrylic mold. So I just measure and mix the silicone and put it in the chamber. The vacuum pump takes about a minute to empty the chamber and bubbles start rising on the surface of the silicone. Once enough air is gone, I tell the motor to move the cup and pull the silicone into the mold. There are still a few bubbles because the pump only reaches like 10% vacuum or so. But doing a two or three cycles of pressurizing and removing the air again gets rid of those as well. Once that's done, it's waiting for a few hours and then removing the lens from the mold. I'm using a 3D printed part as a spacer for this mold because only top and bottom need to be really precise and I don't care about the optical quality of the side of my lens. All parts of the mold are aligned with dowel pins and fixed with screws. That was the simplest design I could come up with. So that's my flexible lens. You can see a slight whitish tint that's due to the cheap silicone. The lenses look pretty clear and the liquid silicone of course will be a bit forgiving and not perfectly replicate the tiniest scratches found in the optical surface. Everything smaller than a micron or so will probably be gone. Maybe a bit more given the viscosity of this particular silicone. That's a part of the reason for my good enough approach. Another reason is that the resulting lens will be flexible, so dimensional accuracy requirements are kind of low anyway. In case you're wondering what this lens is supposed to do, the first surface of the lens you see here is a focal length that is equal to its width. Any light reflected by objects touching the other surface will be exiting the lens collimated. Basically, that means that we got a squishy magnifying glass that works at any distance, as long as your camera or your eye is focused at infinity. But that's something for another video. So, problems. When you're grinding and polishing with a giant ball, you are kind of limited in the geometry. Of course, your mold will be concave, obviously, but also you can't have cavities or recesses. You need to reach the surface with the ball. Also, you need to be able to spin and tilt the mold while polishing, so you're limited in the overall size as well. Another issue is that the whole process is really, really slow. You can easily spend a full day taking care of the machine and applying new paste. But if you try to speed things up and let the ball spin too fast, you will create too much friction and may let the acrylic instead of polishing it. The silicon I use has a shore hardness of A19, and that's rather soft compared to really soft silicones. But if that's a problem or actually desirable, depends very much on your application. Okay, this whole video is already a bit longer than I originally anticipated, but anyway. Extra info and links to everything I discussed are in the description. If you know a bit more, got a recommendation for clear silicone, or have a better solution for any of those steps, please let me know, I always appreciate that.